is that uh, the, the, the other disappointment with Locke is that you still have this entity reflecting on the contents of its consciousness. So, in addition to certain logical problems with the thesis and common sense or counterintuitive problems with the thesis, it doesn't really do the job it's set out to do because you still have some sort of enduring X that must be the, the entity reflecting on the contents of consciousness. So, predictably, enter Hume. Hume. Quote, I think this is word for word, I must own that when I search for myself, I can find nothing but a bundle of perceptions. He can find nothing but a bundle of perceptions. Now this is a predictable empiricist position on, on the question, but, but do follow what Hume is saying. Try to give some thought about anything that isn't finally reducible to thought about something that figures at the level of perception. Even if it's some sort of rearrangement of former percepts. To be thinking is to be thinking about something. Now you might just be thinking about relations of ideas, you know, that, that every number is equal to itself. But if you're conducting, if, if you're thinking about something you're granting a physical reality to, call it yourself, then you're thinking in property terms. You're thinking that you're sitting, you're thinking that you're tired, you're thinking that it was cold about a half hour ago till you got in this lecture, well, etc., etc. So, so what's, what you've got then is a bundle of perceptions. Now you might ask the question, well don't we need a percipient now observing the bundle of perceptions, after all, what constitutes the ground of the continuity of the entity in question? <coughs> and there, Hume offers this interesting reply. He says, look, well, think of a parade formation. Now, everyone marching in the parade is replaceable. And as long as when one party drops out, he is replaced by another one. The continuity of the formation is preserved, even though you have these otherwise incessant changes. So that it, it, this is almost a kind of a Jamesian stream of consciousness argument. This, this, this continuous flow of, of experiences. What William James referred to rather poetically, as the ever-passing present thought. So, the bundle of perceptions. Respect for what Pope and Swift and company had, had, had produced. Now, Kant's position is predictably entirely different from either the empiricist side of the equation or the Scottish common sense side of the equation. Though, as I've said repeatedly, the, the longer I stay with this literature, the more convinced I am that Reed's inquiry in redacted, translated form mightily influenced Kant's thought. I'm joined in this judgment by Karl Americh's, who in my estimation is um, perhaps the best of our contemporary Kant scholars. Now, now, at, now at Notre Dame. For Kant, it is a necessary feature of the human mind that experiences are unified in a single consciousness. It's only when there is consciousness of the result of the synthesis of the manifold that in a sense can rise to the level of a comprehended state or condition with content. The transcendental unity of our perception refers then to what are finally the necessary conditions for the unification of elements of, of empirical apperception. The, these things that are gleaned by the senses and give rise to sensations and 
and these sensations then are uh, in the form of perceptions becoming subsumed under general categories. All of this must be unified. You understand why it must be unified. If Jack is the one who senses the blue, and Jill is the one who senses the tree, and Frank is the one, you get the picture. There's no way any of this can be merged into a scene. It, 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 and nonetheless, there isn't anything in the stimulus itself that supplies the means of unification. This has to be an a priori power common to minds of a certain kind, namely minds of our kind. So the transcendental unity of our perception refers to what are finally necessary conditions for the unification of the various elements of empirical apperception. But this must operate a priori is established by the fact that nothing at the level of appearances themselves contains within it the means by which to establish such unification. It's not in the stimulus. What is required is what Kant refers to as an act of the imagination. This is at B154, and that section will repay it close reading on your part. What's required is what Kant refers to as an act of the imagination, which is known not as a representation, but directly by way of the act itself. To quote Kant at B153, it is conscious to itself, even without sensibility, do you see? That, that, that you, as a conscious entity, are aware of these powers that you have, is not something engaged by or triggered by sensibility itself. This is something that would be there were there not sensibility. As this is a necessary and universal condition of, of experience itself, it is grounded in an a priori substrate, which Kant calls the transcendental ego. Now, um, save me from saying anything contemporary, please. It all begins to sound like the telegraph or something. But I, I do think it would be useful for persons uh, taking on the very difficult task of the self, writing on the self, to make a distinction between Kant's transcendental ego and Kant's uh, most of the literature I'm familiar with has to do with what might be called the psychological dimensions of selfhood. The transcendental dimension is the necessary dimension. It, it's, it's what can be argued into place if no one were ever aware of oneself. It's not the fact that you're aware of yourself that these things happen. In fact, were there not the a, priori, the a priori conditions of the unification of empirical apperceptions, there wouldn't be any awareness at all. Do you know why? Because there wouldn't be any thought at all. That's what it meant when he said that the transcendental unity of apperception finally understood just is thought. As this is a necessary and universal condition, it's grounded in an a priori substrate, and that's the one that Kant refers to as the transcendental ego. James Van Cleve has summarized Kant's concept of this transcendental ego, contrasting it with the empirical ego. I want to read you a passage from Van Cleve, um, but I, I also want you to note that I uh, not strongly disagree. That almost sounds like dyspepsia. I, I, I'd be quite reserved about the last sentence in this passage. Quote, In the philosophy of Kant, the transcendental ego is the thinker of our thoughts, the subject of our experiences, the willer of our actions, and the agent of the various activities of synthesis that help to constitute the world we experience. With hesitation, I, I, I say that that's a decent enough 
quick summary. Now, then he says, it is probably to be identified with our real or nominal self. How do you know that? We don't know things like that. This is where you, you, you want to engage in that exercise of Thomas Reed's of laying your hands across your lips. See, every time you're on the verge of saying, well, you know what it is nominally, you want to say, well, you know what it is... Must <laughs> <laughs> must do it. Uh, at at uh, B490, at uh, A492, B520, the transcendental subject is equated by Kant with the self proper as it exists in itself. And that, I think, is what led Van, Van Cleef to say, well, you know, it's, it, it's, it, this, is, uh, this is the noumenal self. Kant is suggesting something that's equated with, not something that's known as. Now, this is contrasted with an empirical ego, which is reached by way of introspection. The I, the self that accompanies all experience and consciousness. As a subjective feature of perception, it distinguishes one person from another. When you say things like, let me tell you something about myself, that, that's what you're referring to. You're not, that's not the transcendental ego, that's the cafe ego. Self-disclosure is a very effective form of ingratiation. Unfortunately, we learned this at a very early age, and so we become gabby for the next 70 years. Well, let me tell you about myself. To which the polite reply is, oh, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> so, against Hume, Kant offers this as a conclusion. It is absolutely necessary that in my knowledge, all consciousness should belong to a single consciousness, that of myself. You see, Hume doesn't give us the, the belonging. He has a kind of mechanism by which some, what, psychic stuff, perceptual stuff, bundled stuff, gets held together. But, but not in a way that, 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 that could be known because there isn't a knower. He, Hume knows there's a knower, for goodness sake. He's writing this. When Kant says this, he is not offering a factual claim based on introspection. Rather, it pertains to the logical form of all knowledge as necessarily relating to a faculty or power by which unification becomes possible. And this just is the faculty of apperception. So Kant is here to explain how a bundle of perceptions might rise to the level of human understanding. And in the end, how might we best summarize that, that explanation? I should tell you that, that he is respectful of Hume in these regards. Not, not just the fellow who awakened him from dogmatic slumber, but he sees Hume as the culmination, in, in, in Kant's day anyway, the culmination of, of, of an empirical tradition that in important respects includes Newton. You, you've got to be very careful about what part of this project you're going to jettison 